Hello, and welcome to tonight's uh, Idea to IPO. I say tonight because I'm here in San Francisco, California, and it's night. Uh, but where you are, it could be the day. Uh, so Idea to IPO is run by Rob Lau and was formed in February of 2010. At that point in time, there were no members, no, no meetups, no organizations. Since then, Rob has grown the organization to over 100,000 members. I believe they've done over 2,400 events at this point. And uh, I've had the pleasure to work with them since about 2013 or so, initially doing in-person events, but now we're coming uh, to you virtually because of COVID and the events of 2020. With that in mind, I I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm a corporate and uh, venture capital attorney here in San Francisco, California. I'm with Pulsinelli, which is a 900 attorney law firm uh, with over 25 offices, about 25 offices here in the United States. I work with entrepreneurs all throughout their life cycle. I'll tell you a little bit about, more about myself in a minute. But first I wanna talk about uh, the way that today's event is going to be run. And I'm also gonna see if I can sort of slide out uh, of our logo here. So let's see, maybe that looks better. So here's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to talk about convertible notes and safe financings. These are within the realm of seed financings and we'll talk about that in a minute. What I'd like to do is spend about an hour or so talking uh, about it. I wanted to try and be interactive. I think that we're, we actually have quite a number of folks who've signed up for today's event. So if you'd like to um, make a comment, you want some interaction, you wanna have some more information about a topic, please use the Q&A function, okay? What I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be monitoring that. So not only am I presenting today, but I'm also troubleshooting and running everything else in the background. If I don't see your question, I don't see your comment, please don't be offended. Uh, what I wanna do is kind of pause as we move through the material today uh, to see if uh, I can answer any questions on the fly. If, uh, you know, we'll speak for about an hour after that, we'll hopefully take uh, about another half hour or so of Q&A if there are any questions that haven't gotten answered along the way. Maybe I'll get a chance to share with you some more stories, some things that you'll want to try and avoid. And uh, that's pretty much it. Let me just see here on the notes. Oh, one other thing I just want to mention, you know, today's program is being recorded. So if you have a comment, uh, please understand that's gonna be recorded in posterity. So the advantage is you miss some or all of today's program, or if you just didn't even make it today, if you've registered, we'll follow up, we'll send you a recording of today's event so you'll be able to see it. Downside, whatever you say or do might be uh, memorialized in posterity. So please don't share any confidential information at this point, and please understand that we are recording. All right. Now, a couple more caveats. I wouldn't be an attorney or hopefully a decent attorney if I didn't give you some caveats. Today's discussion is gonna be about general information. It's not gonna be legal advice. It's not gonna be advice that's specific to your situation. In dealing in seed financings, which is something that I do day in and day out as part of my job, uh, very subtle or specific facts will completely shift the analysis. Um, you know, as to which rule applies, which exception to the rule applies. Uh, information that an entrepreneur believes is pertinent or might actually be impertinent and information that a, a, an entrepreneur thinks might be impertinent can be really critical to, to making a decision in terms of which way uh, or what legal advice we would dispense or give to them. So with that in mind, uh, it's general information don't rely on it. You need to consult and engage your own attorney who's trained and focused in this practice area to give you the best advice. And um, again, just a reminder, even if I take some of your questions, I try to answer them, it's gonna be general guidance. In today's discussion, we're not gonna get into all the facts in order for me to give you um, specific legal advice for your situation. All right, so the roadmap for today is my background. We'll talk about structural considerations for these raises. We'll talk about things that you should be thinking about when you're pitching to investors. We'll talk about your financing options in this space. We'll talk about key terms and other considerations as you're potentially negotiating these deal docs, uh, hopefully in conjunction with working with your counsel. We'll talk about common mistakes. Uh, we'll talk about how to close your seed financing and we'll talk about important 
post-closing tasks. And we'll, we'll hit at the end um, sort of the catch-all of uh, mistakes and uh, other things, that, other pitfalls. So let's talk a little bit about who should be watching this webinar. So the person who's gonna receive the most value of this is probably somebody who's at or right about to do a seed financing. Uh, that said, if you are considering doing a startup that is a venture-backed startup, uh, you'll probably receive some value out of this. If you've already gotten past a seed financing, um, I think you may still learn a little bit more, but it's really kind of geared towards those folks who are interested in raising a seed financing. And we've got already one question. Ah, excellent. So Benjamin asked, will the slides be available? Yes. So when we follow up with the video, we'll also follow up with the slides. Um, so thank you for answering or asking that question. Great question. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'm a corporate attorney, and more specifically, I work in the venture capital and emerging growth company space. Uh, I've been practicing law since 2005. I'm with Paulson LA, which is an AMLAW 100 firm and with approximately 900 attorneys and over 20, 25 offices or so throughout the US. My office is in San Francisco, but I work with entrepreneurs and companies throughout the world. That's particularly true because San Francisco is an international hub. It's kind of part of the Silicon Valley ecosystem. And I love working with entrepreneurs and executives um, on their financings on their outs as, and as their outside general counsel. That's the person who troubleshoots a lot of the legal issues that come in in a particular day. Uh, I find, my clients find that I'm a particularly good fit because I've got that entrepreneurial spirit. Before I came here, which is a really large firm, I started my own firm and ran that for about five or six years or so. It was a lot of fun, uh, but I needed a bigger platform to be able to serve my clients and that's why I'm here. Great. So let's learn a, bit, a little bit about folks who are in the room today. So, so far we've got about 52% of the people have uh, answered the survey that I set up. Um, I'll give you another 10 or 20 seconds if you'd like to uh, fill out the rest of the survey, see if that moves the numbers anymore. But the numbers are kind of lining up a little bit with what I would expect to see. All right. I'm gonna take a quick drink of water and we'll keep chugging. So who do we have in the room today? We've got about 47% of the people are first time founders. That's very common. That's what, about what I expect to see. Usually I see between 40 and 60. Uh, we've got folks who are on their second, third, fourth or more uh, startup. And those are what we categorize as the serial entrepreneurs. Um, I guess some folks are having some issues with the polls. I, I apologize for the technical issue. Uh, Oh, I'll address that in a second. We've got a couple of angel investors, a couple of corporate, or at least one corporate VC, some students. Great to have the students as always. Service providers. So you know, maybe we've got some other attorneys, maybe we've got some accountants. And um, then as we move to the latter questions, which are really geared towards uh, the serial entrepreneurs, okay? So if you're a first timer, these, these two questions don't apply to you. Um, I want to learn a little bit about who, who's on their second or third go. Now, when we have these conversations or we do these presentations in person, this is always a great opportunity to have folks raise their hand and then share their story about their prior startup and share a little bit about they, what they've learned. Um, I find that's really valuable for first time entrepreneurs to hear about how entrepreneurship is really an amalgam of many different skills, um, skills that involve you know, figuring out how to innovate, uh, running the operations of the company, networking to raise capital, uh, skills with regard to marketing. And so we have, we usually take an opportunity to have some of the folks who are on their second or third, um, uh, second or third company to just comment on, on how they did the first time and what they learned. So that's why if we take a look here, we see that of the folks who are on their second or third, um, 65% of it never made it, pat, never made it beyond the seed financing the first time. Uh, about 16% raised seed funding, but then ran out of funding. And that was probably the end of their startup. Uh, looks like 6% exited after a seed funding, 6% after a series A and 14% after a B or later. Now, again, geared towards those serial entrepreneurs, 
and I think this is really important for the first time entrepreneurs to hear, you know, 57% uh, would characterize their exit as a crash and burn. 20% um, would ca characterize it as an aqua hire. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, basically the, the, the value of the team that you've built as an entrepreneur is more valuable than the technology or the company that you've built. And so a company, a, so a larger company like Apple, Google, Facebook, you know, you, you name it, uh, those are some of the largest companies, but a larger company will seek to acquire the team by, excuse me, seem to hire, it would, will, uh, will hire the team by acquiring the company. So that's an aqua hire. Um, looks like in terms of then how successful exits were in 8%, only the preferred received liquidity, that is got, got some cash from the deal. 10%, all stockholders receive some consideration. 6% would consider their exit an M&A, uh, a lucrative M&A exit. And then 13% went IPO or some sort of other public offering or having public security. So I'm gonna end the poll there. So that's who's in the audience. By and large, it's mostly first time entrepreneurs. We've got some repeat players. And then a good mix of folks who, some of whom were characterized themselves as financially successful, others who wouldn't. And I bet if you were in the room with them right now, they would tell you, even if they didn't have a successful exit, they learned a lot on their first go and they're so much more prepared for their second or third time or third try. Okay, let's let's make sure that we're talking about some of the structural basics here to all get on the same page. So I, I'm here in the United States, I'm here in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, you know, ecosystem. When we're talking about startups, uh, I'm using a very specific, or I'm focused on a very specific type of company, a very specific type of client. I'm talking about venture backed companies. Those are companies that are going to need to grow and scale substantially in order to take advantage and to, to mature as companies. Um, they're gonna require millions of dollars, raising tens of millions of dollars in order to scale to do that. And they have sort of a, at least in the legal sense, a well-worn path of how this works, okay? It's almost always a Delaware C Corp for reasons that um, we'll just touch on briefly. Um, and they usually will start out with some seed funding. So then that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about seed fundings today. So that is the initial capital to put together a prototype and to put together an initial team. And if you look, there's always this really help, I think very effective diagram on the startup financing cycle, which I've included here. So as you'll see, uh, the seed capital space, it, it, so we've got revenue tracked against time you'll see basically the seed capital stage takes up a, a large chunk. Uh, and frequently we will see, it will take an entrepreneur three or four years sometimes to raise uh, a series A round or sometimes a series seed round. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but there are a lot of um, failures in this period of time. Uh, there's no revenue and it does require frequently millions of dollars in order to, uh, to, to make it through this period of time. And at that point, once you have a prototype together, you've got that initial team together, maybe you started to uh, put your product out in the marketplace, uh, you'll start generating some revenue kind of around that time. That's when you'll start with that first raise, which we call a series A raise. I'm going to just share the results of the poll, close this. Now we set up, I'm going to move quickly through this part because this isn't really the meat of the topic, but the reason why we usually end up with the Delaware C Corp is that's what the investors are going to want to insist on seeing. If you get yourself set up with an LLC, uh, if you get yourself set up in another state, it's fairly common that we'll end up needing to uh, figure out a way to flip you over to a Delaware C Corp. Uh, it's usually, in my experience, more effective to get set up properly the first point uh, in this first place, but not everybody does that. It's not necessarily the end of the world but it is sort of one of those ways that you can end up having some problems with your startup. Now, let's see, I think there was one question. Okay. Now, there are some baseline considerations that you need to be thinking about when you're pitching investors. And, and when I'm speaking, you know, I'm speaking about here in the United States, I'm speaking about even more specifically California, which is where I'm licensed in practice. 
but some of this will apply. So securities laws are basically um, laws to protect the public from folks who would be unscrupulous and would run around and sell stock or other securities in their company um, and their companies are absolutely worthless. So uh, lots of folks who are at the beginning of their startup uh, think, well, it couldn't possibly mean me because I'm not a bad guy. And then the answer is it probably is not you, but uh, the, the laws still apply. And there are two sets of laws here in the United States. There are the federal laws, um, which are usually overseen by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then each state has its own set of securities laws, uh, and those are called blue sky laws. So you've got to make sure that you're complying with both levels. What we, what we will end up doing, especially at the early stage, is we'll make sure there's compliance. But compliance isn't you need to file an S1 and, and prepare and go public. The, the compliance is making sure that you've got specific targeted exemptions. And those really relate to um, usually pre-existing relationships that you've had with the investor so they know whether or not you're a fraudster or a huckster. Um, and also the size of the offering and the means by which you are conducting, conducting the offering. That is, uh, we stay away from what would be called a general solicitation. Again, you need to stay with people who are in your network. Um, and it's important to work with competent counsel on this particular kinds of issues, because as we'll talk about later, uh, it can be a real pitfall if you end up raising money you think you have, and it turns out you didn't comply with these laws and you end up having to give it back or some of it back or offering people the opportunity to take their money back. All right, here's why we're here today, 20 minutes in or maybe 15 minutes in or so, <clears throat> but I think it's worth the buildup. So today we're talking about seed financing. We're really talking about probably that first two, $3 million that you're raising. Uh, and there are usually sort of three different methods to, to do that. Now, when I say two to $3 million, it could be in a round. It could be in a couple of rounds, um, but the goal here is to figure out what is the right structure for your funding and uh, what are the terms that you're going to use to do that and also give you some understanding as to why that is. So here in the, in the Bay Area, this is the sort of mechanisms that we see in this space are convertible debt or convertible equity. Convertible debt is also sometimes called a bridge note because initially it kind of harkened back to it was supposed to be a bridge to, to get you from where you are today to your first venture financing. Uh, and then convertible notes, excuse me, convertible equity is more commonly known these days as safes. And convertible debt and convertible equity are pretty similar. We'll talk about this, what's the same, what's different um, in a moment. Now, the other thing that you'll sort of maybe see or hear about in the sort of two to $3 million space, especially if it's all one round, are series seed and maybe even a series A. Now, I do, I have done work, you know, outside of the Bay Area uh, quite frequently. Um, and so um, what you'll find is what we do here is all, all business is sort of custom and relationship. So as you move to different parts of the country or different parts of the world, there's sort of different customs and relationships and, and how people form and do business. And the documents will reflect that. Uh, now, outside the Bay Area, it's more common to maybe see a Series C uh, around at 2 million or, or, or so, or maybe even less. But in the Bay Area, you know, I think we're looking at at least two, three million, maybe even 5 million or, or more. Uh, I've got a question. I see there are investors on here. Have they been vetted or is this an open door meeting? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. So if this question is getting at, do you need to be concerned about whether or not being in this room is going to set you up for a public solicitation uh, issue? I think the answer is probably going to be no, because the goal of this is not to have you pitch and not to have you uh, uh, chase these investors. The goal of this evening is to provide you with information about series seed financings, what they are and what's in the documents and sort of what you'd expect to see in a, in a common, uh, not series seed, but in a seed financing. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but you know, anyone is welcome here. Pulsinelli is sponsoring it, so it's free. Uh, we're glad to have everyone here. All right. 
Let's talk about convertible securities. Now, when I use this in the context of seed financings, I'm talking about basically safes and convertible debt. And the goal there is to convert these instruments to future equity securities at a negotiated discount um, in a qualified equity financing. What the heck does that mean? That means basically what we wanna do here is have folks get a placeholder um, between a placeholder in terms of buying a stake in the company. We want to generally want to, and one of the reasons why we, we choose these mechanisms are to avoid valuing the company at this point in time. Now, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and the value, especially the pre-money valuation of the company is something that they take as a point of pride. They want to see that, comp that they want to see that, uh, that number increasing. And the risk here, especially at this very early stage is it's very difficult to value an early stage company. Uh, and one of the other reasons why you want to avoid valuing the company at this point is if you're going to be hiring folks and you're going to be um, incentivizing them with equity, whether that is restricted stock, or you're going to be incentivizing them with options, you want to usually avoid trying to value the company because otherwise they're going to need to either pay the, the fair market value when they receive that equity compensation, or they'll have to pay tax on the difference between whatever it is they paid for that compensation and what it is that they've got. So if they didn't pay anything and the stock's worth $10, they're gonna owe tax on, the, on that $10. If they paid 10, alternatively, they're gonna to need to pay $10 to get that $10 share. Um, now, another reason at this, at this point is that investors want the capital going to growing the business at this point. They don't wanna necessarily spend the money um, uh, negotiating, diligencing um, this early stage company because one, it's just it's a, it's a waste. It's a waste of transaction costs, uh, or they will sometimes view it as a waste of transaction costs. Uh, I see a question. I'm going to answer that one at the end, or I'll come back to that one at the end. So convertible se securities. Here's what you're going to sort of usually expect to see, and I've trying to do both the convertible note and the safe at the same time. And I put asterisks, asterisks by the uh, terms that are gonna be in a convertible note only. So a convertible note is debt. So that means it comes due at some point and we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's in there, but it's not in a safe. Interest rate, convertible note is debt. So there's an interest rate, just like there's an interest rate on your car note, there's an interest rate on your credit card. Um, conversion terms, both convertible notes and safes are going to have conversion terms. Those are the mechanics of how you take that sort of prepayment that they put in, maybe the interest if you've got a convertible note, and then convert it or roll it into equity when there is a qualified financing, which is a preferred stock financing. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, what we also like to see is uh, take a look at are the amendment terms, okay? So um, that's talking about how if you need to change the terms of one of these instruments, what is whose approval do you need to get? Is it the company and each of the investors or is it gonna be sort of the majority in interest, the holders of majority in interest, which is, usually, is the better route. Um, and we can talk about why that's a better, better route in a little bit, but basically it comes down to the fact that um, although you may want to, you know, cut each person the same deal, uh, there may be a point in time in the future where the deal needs to get recut in order to make the, the financing happen or to make some other milestone or to keep the company alive. And you don't want somebody, one individual to have veto, effectively veto authority. It gives them too much leverage. They can extract too much out of the company. Uh, the remaining terms in these instruments are not particularly common to negotiate. Um, I say that, you know, if you're working kind of in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, but it doesn't necessarily hold true uh, elsewhere. So I've, I've worked on some European deals or some folks with investors from Europe. It's a much different style, um, much more robust. Sometimes they'll have registration rights, which deals with the rights to, to make the company register and go public. Um, they'll have much more thorough uh, reps and warranties that are factual representations by the company and other legal representations by the company in terms of who owns the IP or whether or not they own the IP. 
Um, sometimes there'll be some security provisions in there in terms of giving the, the debt holder um, a security interest on the IP. Those are much less common here and much less common in these seed financings. But again, all of these deals or each of these deals is somewhat local. And um, if you move out of the Bay Area, you're gonna to expect to see some different things. So take what I say today um, as a jumping off point not the end all be all. Now I'm gonna pause right here. I'm gonna see, we've got a couple questions in here. See if now's the time to answer them or if we should try and address them later. Okay, I'm gonna answer these, or I'm gonna address these questions at the end. So let's talk about some of these terms. This one's focused primarily on convertible debt. Okay, usually we will see a maturity date. That is the date when the principal and interest come due. Uh, and you're gonna wanna pick a date. Now, we generally sort of see in the 18 to 24 month range. So we're talking about a year and a half to two years. We've seen them as low as 12 months. It could be even less than that. Just depends on when you expect to have this financing. The sort of take home point here is that you should really be trying to time this with when you're gonna have a venture round. That is when, when the convertible note's gonna convert and make sure you build some cushion in there, okay? Because it always takes longer to do a round than you think. I think probably from when you think you're gonna start going to do a round to when you close a price round, I, rule of thumb pre-COVID, I would say take at least, think about it at least taking six months. It can certainly go faster than that, okay? And, and But by the time you've, you know, you've probably done your pre-diligence, um, that is start to already get to know investors, build relationships. So to when you then say, okay, I wanna go out and raise, you still gotta bring every, you gotta do a lot of dancing, a lot of additioning. Um, there's some chance encounters, it just takes time. Now, there are other laws that are out there that you need to sort of think about that sort of dovetail with maturity. Out here in California, we have the California financing law which applies to persons engaged in the business of a finance lender or of a broker. Um, usually this is not an issue if you're raising money from venture capitalists, uh, but if you're raising money from individuals who ha happen to um, be doing a lot of convertible notes, it, it might be a problem. It's probably more of a problem for them than for your company, but it's, it's important to make sure that you're uh, heads up on these particular types of issues. Let's talk about interest rates. Again, interest rates um, are not, uh, they're something that's a feature of convertible debt, not safes or convertible securities, excuse me, convertible equity. Now, there are some things on here that you, you there's some bounds, okay? So kind of the general rules we usually see, I don't know, maybe six or 8% in there. Something that reflects some risk, but again, that the interest is not really what's moving the investor to put the money in the company. The real money is, uh, or the real investment is motivated by the fact that you know, they believe, and hopefully you believe as well, you should believe, that company's gonna grow in scale, it's gonna raise venture capital, it needs that capital to scale out sufficiently, and that's gonna give um, them a fantastic return on their capital. The interest rate's not what's doing it. Now, <clears throat> we, we see this as low as AFR, which is the applied federal rate, is basically a, a rate that uh, the federal government says the IRS says you need to be taxed this minimal amount, otherwise you're gonna be imputed interest. That is basically, it's gonna be implied that you have interest and you'll have to pay tax on it. Or, you know, for example, in California, there's a 10% interest rate um, or a usury. So there are some exceptions to this, but there are usury laws, which basically preclude people from lending um, money at outrageous uh, interest rates. So you just need to be mindful of that. So you kind of see two bounds. We usually sort of end up at six or 8% is what we see. Um, you know, we will need to see that the loans are for business purposes, not personal or family purposes. And again, you, a pre-existing relationship with the borrower and lender um, is always critical or something that we'll, we'll want to see. And we can talk you through that if we end up working with you on that matter. Okay, so here's maybe the largest or most important takeaway um, for today's discussion, um, conversion terms. So this is really where the magic happens, if you will, at when you take this sort of prepayment as it is sometimes, you, you can think of this sort of like a prepayment, right? You, you've got this debt security out there with the purpose of 
eventually converting over into equity, or you've got the safe, which is basically like a forward contract for equity. Um, when does it convert? Well, you'll find within these documents that there are mechanics that are built in. And the mechanics are around uh, what the definition of a qualified financing is. So what we'll see is that it's an equity financing. Uh, that is not another debt financing. So what does that mean? Well, if you go out and raise another convertible note round, even if you raise $5 million, depending upon what the definition is, it's likely it wouldn't trigger the conversion. Uh, now, sometimes we also will specify that it's not just an equity financing, but also a preferred equity financing, preferred stock financing, uh, just to give a little bit more clarity that really what we're talking about is a venture around here. And there's a minimum threshold. So it's very common here to have a threshold of at least $2 million. The, the point here is if that number is too low, the investor in the convertible note or the safe might get worried, you know what, um, they're going to, you know, this company is going to play games with me. They'll do a preferred stock financing and raise $10 at some strange valuation. And what that's going to end up doing is it's going to convert me over at some mechanic that is all messed up and they're going to screw me over. So the, the point here, at least on these early seed stage rounds, is to get a number that's sort of big enough that, you know, if someone's putting this kind of money in, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's with a legitimate arm's length. Uh, deal, right? Uh, it's not it's not the company just finding a buddy to put in ten dollars and, and make an outrageous valuation. Um, now, I want to circle back to a point that okay, so we've got a little bullet here saying the discount has to be reasonable, or later investors will not go for it. Is it anywhere from sort of fifteen to twenty to twenty five is is typically what we consider probably pretty reasonable out here depends on a couple of things. It depends on, you know, just how long it is until you anticipate um, raising. You know, if you've already got another investor, if you've already got, or it's close to having a preferred financing lined up and, uh, you know, you just need a couple hundred thousand dollars to literally bridge you for a month, you know, you might see very little discount or even no discount. Um, but absent that, you know, the sort of typical thing that we'd see is sort of 20, 25% or so, um, 15% pops up from time to time too. Uh, again, to circle back to what I mentioned before about the amendment provision and why I always take a look at each of these to, to make sure that, you know, you've got some mechanism where you can basically get a majority of the, of the convertible note holders or the majority of the safe holders. And when I say those holders, I really mean the holders of the the uh, the majority of the outstanding principal for convertible notes, or the majority of the outstanding um, amount raised in the safes, is so that if there's some issue that the new money wants to see resolved, you have a mechanism. So you just have to go out and get um, a large enough con you know a contingent of people to do it, as opposed to each and every one of them. So, for example, if you if you granted or not granted, if you had a 65% discount, um, it's quite possible the new money would not want to see sort of the founders being eroded that much, especially if the if the founders were already fairly diluted. And we'll talk about dilution in a little bit. But, um, you know, you need to get that changed. So you don't want to necessarily have to get each and every one because, you know, you could get everyone signed up for, except for one and that last person could extract, uh, could extract uh, some favors or some other things out of the company that would be um, suboptimal to say the least. All right. We're getting some great questions, but I feel like mo most of these are going to be well handled at the end. So I'm going to just keep chugging along. Conversion terms um, continued. So when we're talking about the mechanics, as we just did, I want to talk about what, what are the two big two big levers in here that we see. We see a conversion price cap and we see a conversion upon a change of control and sale. Um, and we also see optional conversion upon maturity or something less than a qualified financing. So these are all levers. We always see probably the first one and two. Um, number three, in terms of there being a mechanism to have a conversion, even if the note basically becomes due, less common. And in that case, again, you want that amendment provision so that you can go out and just get 
a, you know, majority of folks to sign off on pushing the maturity date back. Otherwise, the note comes due and potentially you will need to either pay it back and you, you know, or your company will need to pay it back and your company may not have the money or you're gonna end up in bankruptcy. Um, now, let me give you a couple of tips about what a price cap does. The price cap acts basically as a sweetener on top of a discount. So you can have, no, you can have these, these instruments with a discount. You can have them with a cap. You can have them with a cap and a discount. Um, and the price cap basically acts as a sweetener so that if for some reason, you know, you the investors put in that $500,000 or a million bucks, and that's like all you need to really take your company to the next level. It's now worth a hundred million dollars. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you'll see actually that they're going to get sort of a super turbocharged, um, as return a number of shares about that. And that, that's gonna come out of sort of the pre-existing equity holders who are by and large the, the, uh, the founders. Now, sometimes, and this always comes up in these topics is that evaluation is, uh, excuse me, a cap is really evaluation. And sort of in one sense, I mean, I sort of con considered a little bit of a backdoor evaluation, if you will. Um, it's not a valuation in the sense that like, okay, it actually values your company. And as a result of that, when you issue, um, you know, when you issue options to your employees, they're going to be using that valuation cap as that, as the, as the basis for what the exercise price is on that option. It's not like that at all, but it does um, sort of provide a mechanism by which, you know, the investor and the company are putting a stake in the ground and potentially saying, yeah, you're going to have at least X percent of the company as a result of this. So running pro formas, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, pro forma cap tables based on what you think you're going to raise is super critical. And it's not just for this round, but thinking about back to that slide where we have the financing life cycle and think about all those sort of um, points in time where you have additional raises. Ideally, you're going to try and model that out at least a couple of rounds ahead, what you think you're going to need. Now, the other thing that comes up is our discounts, and that is pretty simple. I mean, it's usually just whatever the preferred pay, the, um, the safes will convert at that price um, with, with the discount applied. So if it's a 20% discount, they will pay 80% of whatever the preferred pay. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. One concept that often comes up, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, is the concept of a shadow series. If you take a look at a safe, you'll see shadow series. So what that is, is that's uh, it's usually the series of preferred stock that the safe holder or the convertible note holder will roll into. It'll have all of the same attributes as the new money's uh, stock, except for the fact their um, liquidation preference will be adjusted to reflect the fact that they paid a discount and their dividend preference will also be reflected to, um, will be adjusted to reflect that path. That path. All right, someone's asking for numbers, for example. So we're gonna do that a little bit later, but I, I promise you we're gonna get in there. So decisions, decisions, convertible securities. So the upside is they're usually less expensive. They're kind of most common in this space and they're in one sense simpler. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's less easy to mess up your company with them because there are plenty of founders who have run out, uh, issued safes on their own, especially these new, new safes. Um, and, and kind of given away way more of the company than they thought. But in, but in another sense, you know, it does not involve negotiating, you know, five or six main fin you know, financing documents that are each 20 to 30 pages long and then have a whole slew of ancillary documents that go along with it. Additionally, it avoids valuing the company uh, at this early stage, which is nearly impossible which helps justify a low fair market value for stock options and restricted stock. Downside, uh, at least for debt, is that it is debt and it is gonna be required to be repaid at some point, uh, at least under its terms and those terms need to be honored. So 
Theoretically, the debt holder will get leverage if you run up and past your maturity date. And there are some mechanics that we do build into these. It depends, you know, who you're working with. Um, but again, you know, so sometimes we'll see that the convertible note won't be due until a majority of the of the holders uh, call it. So that's another mechanism to kind of delay or to make sure that it really um, is the will of the majority as opposed to just one person wanting to tank your company and extract something from you. Um, and then the other thing too with this with the convertible note is that there is what's called the extra liquidation preference um, that debt has. So if you think about the order in which people get paid on a company, either when there's an M&A event or the company goes under, it is you know, secured debt as the top. So that's like debt that's got specific assets sort of pledged to it, unsecured debt. And then you're gonna have uh, equity, okay? And within the equity sphere, it's gonna be preferred in, in order of their seniority as they may have negotiated. Finally, you're gonna have common at the end. So um, debt sits above it. If you've got convertible notes out there, um, you know one thing to think about also is that new money will require that they convert over before they will put in a, a preferred stock financing or they'll do a preferred stock financing because otherwise that old money is gonna sit ahead of them. All right, uh, so we talked a little bit earlier about securities laws of the United States, um, of the United States, of the states within the US and also potentially foreign jurisdictions. So here, you know, on the on the federal side, you know, we usually will target either Reg D, which is a safe, you know, provides a safe harbor, or 4A2. Both of these things are at the federal level; it's a private offering. Or we will, you know, here in California, 25102F, and if it is foreign, we'll still usually, at least with regard to the United States laws, you know, usually target Reg D and specifically 506B. Um, now, as opposed to Reg S, which deals with offshore offerings, sometimes we'll do that, but there are additional things that you'll need to get in place in order to qualify for that. One of the things to keep in mind here is that if you are in the United States raising capital from outside the United States, you need to make sure that you comply with the laws and the tax rules in those other jurisdictions. Um, and that's something that's probably more, and so that can involve getting uh, foreign counsel to help with that. Um, but if that's something that interests you, I'd be happy to have an offline conversation about how that gets handled because that's really above the, the breadth of what we're talking about today. Um, now, for those of you who are interested in numbers, we're gonna go in here to just a brief number example because I think the concept, and I, I hit on this many, many times, but the concept of dilution is uh, in one sense to many founders, especially first time founders is a dirty word. Um, in another sense, it is the way that these games, or not the way that these games, but the way that the game is played. And I say that because when you start, you know, you've got 100% equity and like no cash, unless you've got your own cash, you can bring that to the table and that's a great advantage. Um, so, what happens is the company, you know, pieces of the company get traded or sold in exchange for cash over a period of time. Now, when you're talking about, the, and now let, let's talk through how this actually works and operates. Um, I want to first sync up on some, some terminology. So pre-money valuation is the value of the company before the next round of investment comes in. Okay, now, the pre-money valuation usually comes from the investor. Like, so we're talking about a price round here. Let's just call it a series A. And you know, it's a negotiation back and forth between the entrepreneurs and the investors as to what the pre-money valuation of the company is. What that really is, in one sense, it's the value of the company because it's a negotiated arm's length transaction with you know, two people who or two people, two or more people who determine what the value of the company is. In another sense, what it really is, is just the value of, of, or it is the dollar value that the VCs are willing to pay for an, you know, percentage of, of your company. That's kind of it. So, um, you know, because it's not like you can go out and, and sell that to your neighbor. It's really, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get competing offers. Um, 
And, and so you, you might be able to raise that. But in another sense, it is kind of also a, a one off, at least initially, at least until you, you, you establish yourself as a successful company. I say that because what, what confuses founders from time to time is, you know, we do a pre money valuation and then they're, con, con, they're concerned why if they do a 49A valuation, which is what you need to do before you issue options, it determines what the strike price is of the option for your employees. Why, why don't those numbers match up? And the, the answer is really the VC stock get a lot of bells and whistles, and this is the price that they're willing to pay to get a certain percent of your company. Long way saying, pre-money valuation is the value of the company before the money comes in. Post-money valuation is the value of the company after the round of investment comes in. So let's take some numbers here. So I'm going to give you a very simple example and we're going to take it through a round. Um, and we're not going to factor in the option pool. Uh, but let's, let's talk about a company. And it's set up so the numbers are super round. So I can do it on the fly because I'm not good at doing math just on the phone or in a webinar. So we got a pre-money valuation of $10 million. And the way this company got set up is that there were 10 million shares split among three founders equally. Now, we can go into whether or not splitting it all up equally is the right way to do it. Um, but we'll talk about that in the uh, afterwards. So as a result, uh, each of the founders has 3,333,333 shares uh, rounded, if you will. And A, B, and C are all the same. Now, they get to their A round and there's gonna be a $3 million investment. Now, what that means is, you know, the, the, the company and the VCs negotiate, the company is worth $10 million. So you take, the $10 million pre-money, you divide it by the number of outstanding shares and you get a buck a share. So the post money is gonna be the $10 million plus the new money that comes in, $3 million. And so it's 13 million. Now you'll see, you know, initially, right? When the founder probably started, the company is worth like effectively zero. Uh, so their shares went, their interest went from having, from being $0 to being worth 30, 3, well, hold on a second here. Yep, 3,333,333. And they went from having a third of the company to 25% of the company. Now I'm gonna pause there and we're gonna do a little side exercise. And this little side exercise is gonna um, be about the convertible notes or convertible security, if you will. So let's just say, for example, uh, there had been a $500,000 convertible security outstanding. Doesn't matter if it was a safe, doesn't matter if it was a convertible note, at least for the purposes of today's discussion. If, if that security only had a, it, a, a discount feature, that is 25% discount, the holder would have received uh, 666,666 shares of their shadow series. So how did that happen? Okay, so if the, pre, if the new money is paying a buck, there's a 25 discount, 25% discount off of that is 75 cents. So it's $500,000 divided by 75 cents gets you that 666,000 shares. Stop there, move to the other iteration. So you can see how, how a cap works. If ignore the one with the, with the discount at the moment, if there had been a convertible security with a $5 million cap only, so no discount, the holder would have received a million shares. What, how is it that they receive so much more? So the way the math works, the mechanics of this is you take the outstanding amount, the $500,000 for that safe, and then you divide it by this fraction. Here's what the fraction is composed of. The cap divided by the fully diluted basis, which is 10 million at this point in time. So as a result, they're gonna pay 50 cents a share instead of 75 cents a share above. And so when you divide 500,000 by 50 cents, you see they end up with hundred, excuse me, a million shares. Now, as I said before, you can have a convertible note or a safe that's got both a discount and a cap. And when you have that, you, uh, 
the investor is going to get the greater number of shares as a result of doing the math either of the way. So sometimes people think, well, as soon as I hit, the, if you know, as soon as I hit the cap, the the investor is going to get more shares on the cap. That's not really true because there's kind of like this tail on the discount. So I don't know what the math is just off the top of my head, but like, let's just say we take this number, really the pre-money would have to probably come in around 6 million in order for, for the cap to make more sense uh, as opposed to the 25% discount or, or whatnot. Now, that was an aside. I wanna go back to our just sort of core example so you can really you know ignore what we talked about in the mechanics here, but really just think about um, how you move through time and how dilution uh, acts, acts up. So here's what in this, okay. So we've got the situation now where there is a post money of 13 million. The founders each have 3,333,000 shares and change. And the new money's got 3 million shares. New round, great job. With that $3 million, you were able to build out a marketing team. You were able to develop this actual extra functionality um, you hire these extra engineers, things are going great. You know, you're really starting to get some traction in the market. Here's your B. Pre-money is 30 million and the investment here is gonna be $10 million. So here's again how it works. So now the numerator here is gonna be $30 million divided by the 13 million shares that are outstanding. So the new money is gonna be paying $2.31 a share. So they're gonna get roughly when they put in their $10 million 4,329,000 shares. And you will see that then the denominator has increased and we moved up to 17, uh, 17 million and change. Uh, and now you'll see now that originally the founder had 33% or had a third, went to a quarter and is now down to about 20. Um, but previously, you know, initially their stake was zero, then it was worth 3 million. Now their stake is worth 7,699,000 shares. So it's just really critical to run these pro formas um, based on, you know, to build some models in terms of what it is you think, um, you know, how much capital you're gonna need to raise, when you're gonna raise it, and who will you be awarding equity, equity to in the interim? So you can actually see how, you're, um, see how you're diluted over time, if all works well. All right, so I wanna jump into some common pitfalls um, because we're about to sort of run out of time. And then it looks like we've got some great questions. I'm sorry I haven't really taken them uh, during the course of today's conversation, but I wanna make sure that we kind of move through all the material within that hour or so. So common pitfalls are non-compliance with securities laws. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, but um, as I said at the outset, there are a few real perils with this. Okay, so one is, I mean, you do potentially subject yourself to criminal liability if you are making false um, or materially misleading statements or omitting uh, material information. Uh, but that's not necessarily the, you know, assuming you're not doing these, these bad acts, let's just assume you're, you're not complying with the securities laws and, and it's not for some malintent. You know, one of the real perils is that the, the investors may have the right to have their money back. Um, if you don't have that money, you got a real problem. If you do have that money, you have a problem because you still got to potentially open up to other investors as well uh, who came in in that round. It's probably not just the one that wants his money or her money back, but the other folks. The other issue that comes up from time to time is just the expense and the drain of dealing with litigation, which I cannot overstate. Um, I say that as a former litigator. And, and also just the fact that it is a deterrent to new investment, okay? And that's because I think there's an old saw or something that goes along the way, the lines of nobody wants to buy a lawsuit. So, you know, one of the things, especially as you get to the price rounds and you really step, the game steps up, you know, it steps up from um, individuals who are hopefully experienced in that particular area, which you are, there would be smart money who can bring um, maybe some technical advice, some networking, um, you, you know, access to potentially some other capital or other resources, other, other partners, other business partners in the area in terms of customers or suppliers. 
Um, as you move up into the venture round, um, there's dollar figures are much more at stake. The diligence process, you know, the, the investors actually combing through all of the company's books and records. Um, books and records include contracts. Um, it goes up because the, nobody wants to invest in a lawsuit. Another issue I think that comes up is thinking that there are standard terms for these deals. I think, you know, about as standard as you can get is probably working off of a safe. And that's because it's been put out by one organization, Y Combinator, and sort of maintained by that. But even those uh, terms are negotiable. And then when you move into convertible note world, which is, you know, probably where by and large, if you look at the entire world, world where most of these deals are done, they vary dramatically. There are key terms that and key functionality that are the same. We talked about them. We talked about maturity. We talked about interest. We talked about the conversion mechanism. Um, talk about discounts. Talk about caps. That stuff is the same. But other than that, you know, the sky is the limit. People can ask for all sorts of things. Uh, one term that we never see here in the in the Bay Area and in my experience, not the rest of the U.S. either our personal guarantees on these convertible notes. Uh, again, if, if we're talking about an investment in a company that intends to be venture backed, um, the, the play there is to have an instrument so that will convert into equity when it's appropriate, uh, not to make money off the interest and to have the founder be personally liable for it. So we just, we, we might see it in some super unique circumstances, but not as, as the course if you're just raising seed financing. Uh, the issue of finders is a big issue. So a finder is somebody who is, helps connect people to cash. Um, there's actually a lot of, interestingly, um, changes to the regulations that are coming out. And so this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, overview of them. And, and I haven't even had a chance to sort of digest all of them because they're literally like rolling out over the last few days. Uh, but by and large, if you're, if there's going to be somebody who's going to connect um, companies to capital and they're going to get compensation for that, they need to be a registered broker dealer, uh, registered with the SEC and compliant. Otherwise you run the risk of violating a number of securities laws that relate to that. It's a problem for the company because again, you may have to put, give the money back. And then two, it's a real pitfall because there are just a lot of folks out there doing it and it's not, not kosher. Uh, it's not always kosher. It's kind of in between the lines. It's something you need to make sure you have your counsel apprised of um, so that you can avoid, you know, you can make sure that, you know, if there's a, a legal way to do it, it gets done that way. And if there's not a legal way to do it, it doesn't get done. Again, no one wants to buy a lawsuit. No one wants to put their money in just to see that someone else is going to get their money back. These investments are all about the future. They're not about the past. Side letters. So side letters are agreements that are outside of the four corners of the uh, convertible note or safe. They ask for things like information rights, uh, maybe in a, a board seat, maybe uh, an observer seat on the board, maybe pro rata rights. That's the ability to buy into either future financings, whether they're convertible notes, safes, or more likely preferred. Um, and they are <laughs> increasingly common and they take more time than you would like to, to think in terms of um, negotiation for them and sort of papering them. So <clears throat> being aware of what side letters are and that it will up the the, the bill is, is something you should be aware of and, and stay ahead of. And also within those documents, and it's important that especially if you're documenting pro rata rights, like it gets done properly. Like I can't tell you the number of times, like I've seen a pro rata rights letter sort of suggested by someone and is uh, the mechanics of it don't work. That's a real problem. And it becomes a real problem at the financing time because usually you can't have a majority sort of change the side letter. It's just between the investors. So they got a lot of leverage. Uh, one thing that we also see is that uh, because a lot of these documents are readily available to entrepreneurs, they will engage in self-help. The entrepreneurs will engage in self-help. And so they don't go through the proper corporate authorization um, to do the safes and convertible notes. <coughs> 
you know, that is making sure that they've got the proper board consent and that they are actually in good standing in the, in the jurisdiction in which they're registered. So th those can present some problems too. So with that in mind, I think that kind of wraps up the nuts and bolts. I've got 15 questions uh, in about 27 minutes. If you've got a question, please uh, use the Q&A function. And uh, I'm going to try and get through them. There are probably going to be some that I, um, I would be happy to, to circle up with you offline. Uh, so I hold office hours Fridays uh, about between 2 and 3, my time, the specific time. If you're somewhere where that is, uh, you know, if you're interested in having a, a, a friendly conversation, if you're somewhere that that is not a convenient or a time that would work for you, let me know. Um, I'm happy to try and adjust and find some sort of mutually accommodating time. I love supporting entrepreneurs. I think what you people are doing uh, are just is fantastic. So are there ways to limit the amount of tax that one would pay in the situation where you described uh, shares. So I'm not sure exactly what that question is. Maybe that person can re rewrite it or just redirect my attention to what point in time that that was. I just don't know. I apologize. Okay. Um, <clears throat> seed financing through convertible notes in India. So I think we're going to need to circle up on offline about that. I mean, frequently we'll have to work with uh, local council to make sure we're compliant with the Indian laws. I know that there are a number of laws in terms of, you know, what kind of securities can be offered. So that, that one's outside the scope of what I feel comfortable talking about today. Uh, if I get a grant for 250K for the startup, does that help me in getting seed afterwards? Okay, great. Let's talk about grants for a second. So grants usually come from somewhere in the, in the government or that they could come from nonprofit organizations. Um, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you read the fine print on those grants. Um, one of the key components here in this game, in this path that we we're talking about is making sure that the company secures its IP and has you know, security and knows who's on its cap table. Those are kind of like two, two of the really largest fundamental things here. So um, getting a grant can be very helpful. You know, so long as you haven't sort of taken uh, a, a grant from you know, the Department of Defense and they sort of indicate that you, you can't work with anyone else, that you only, they have some sort of right to resell, or I, I don't know, I'm not picking on the Department of Defense, but so long as you've secu sufficiently secured your rights, if you're able to leverage free dollars, if you will, um, investors, I think, will find that uh, usually attractive. Now, I say I think because um, it's going to depend on each situation. The other thing, too, is, as I've said before, investments that are made in, in these companies are about today and tomorrow. They're not about what happened in the past. You know, what happened in the past help set the stage and maybe um, provide some insight as to what's going to happen in the future. But, you know, if their you know, mistake was made in the past and it's no longer an issue that's going to hang up the company, you know, but you still wish it were a little bit different, it's, it's kind of too bad. It's time to think about the future. That's, that's what the investors are putting their money in for. It's the future. It's not for buying out other people. Um, it's about the future of the company and their return on their capital. So, Getting a grant for 250K, yes, I think that that would probably be helpful provided that you've made sure that you haven't given up something that's gonna hurt you commercially commercially in the future. Commercially meaning like in terms of making money or having the business be successful. Which is the best one for entrepreneurs, pre-money saves or post-money saves? So, in or around October 2018, Y Combinator changed their form from having a pre-money safe to having a post-money safe. The reality of it is, is if you are, um, we're seeing the, initially everyone still continue to use pre-money safes. Um, they've done another iteration on the post-money safes. I think that they are becoming more popular. The reality of it is, is it's just math. If you run the pro formas, you know, and you model it out, you can adjust the numbers, whether the caps or the discounts to end up with basically the same outcome, depending upon whatever the situation are. So it doesn't, 
you know, the post money safe, the new safe is supposed to be helpful because it's supposed to uh, make it clear that it is equity and not debt. You know, arguably it's supposed to be, I think it's a bit more investor friendly than, than the pre-money safe, than the old form, but you, you can basically end up kind of where you need to be so long as you've done the math. All right, so we got, if we kind of take it back to one of my much earlier slides, I hope Daniel's still on, but we got a question about why investor or why founders, it's really why, why Delaware C Corp. Um, so here, here's the answer to that question. So it's driven by and large by the investors. The reason why the investors want it are several fold. C Corp, C Corp because the investors that are the the venture capital funds are set up as limited partnerships. That means that they are past their entities. That means that the, um, to the extent their portfolios where their, their uh, investments were taking profits or losses, that, that information or that, that tax a consequence would get passed on to their investor, excuse me, to their LPs who are their investors. Uh, so they need a blocker. And so the C Corp acts as a blocker so that you know when, you, when the startups are incurring losses, those losses aren't getting passed on to the VCs, LPs, which would be an accounting nightmare. Nobody would want that. So C Corp because of the way that the funds are structured. Delaware. Delaware um, has been in the corporate law game since the, you know, they're, they're one of the first movers. They've worked hard at, at, at having the best uh, corporate law in the country. Other jurisdictions have modeled it. Other jurisdictions have fine corporate law, but Delaware's got this. So they're focused on it. They've got sophisticated Delaware Chancery, which is a court that's devoted to uh, business disputes. Uh, they've got the Delaware Secretary of State, which helps move documentation through smoothly and efficiently. And um, you know, they're also known for having more, more protections for directors and officers. If you've got a, a venture capitalist on your, or if you've got venture investment, one of the things that they will probably ask for, certainly if you get towards the later round, is, is having a board seat. So they want liability protection for their directors and officers. Now, why does the Secretary of State, I'm going to move back up. Why does the Secretary of State's office matter? If you're doing mergers, if you're doing financings, you got to get paperwork filed. Um, and, and they're quick, they turn around, you're less apt to have things hung up. And there's always just a really, as, as much as we try, there's always just such a really narrow window to of time to get things filed because nobody wants to wait another second to have those funds hit their bank account. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's a real advantage, believe it or not. And then the, the corporate law structure, I think I mentioned more, more protection for directors and officers. It's also easier to do um, reorgs and mergers and some other things in Delaware. So that's why it's generally favored. Yeah, so uh, got a question about where to get a safe note template. So safes are uh, a creation of Y Combinator and th that's, that's where safes come from. Now, there are some other organizations that have created their own convertible equity forms that are kind of similar to it, but I don't, you know, um, and those kind of started coming around in maybe 2012 or 2013, and they just never really sort of seemed to take off the way that safes took off. How much equity is common to give your employees when at these early stages? Um, let me let me go back to a, a piece that I mentioned earlier, and then kind of flesh this out. The answer is it depends. Um, let me take it all the way back to kind of who the first employees are probably going to be, and those are the founders. You know, uh, it's common to see folks split everything equally. Uh, may or may not be the, the right choice. Uh, one thing that I encourage founders to think about is their relative contributions to the company sort of both today and in the future, and sort of try and adjust the amount of equity to compensate for that. So let's say there's one founder who's quit her job and you know has a whole bunch of connections and has a fantastic amount of technical prowess um, and the other founder is on the fence about it um, it's going to be writing some code in the in the 
you know, in their spare time, not using their current employer's resources for reasons, you know, that's a whole nother topic to talk about making sure that your IP stays clean. But suffice it to say, one founder who's contributing quite a lot, you know, probably their 50-50 split doesn't make sense. Now, as we talk about employees, um, you know, again, if we see a really critical hire for somebody who's going to be participating over a long period of time, it wouldn't be unusual to see them get a couple percentage points or more even, or even to be sometimes we see folks come in as like a, a founder, a sort of a founder later, uh, you know, founder is very much a sort of, it's not a legal term, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't carry uh, any extra legal authority the way that a chief executive officer would have or uh, a, tr a treasurer or a chief financial officer or even a secretary. It carries a lot of moral authority. It carries a lot of weight within a company, within its culture. Um, and maybe you can use the word founder to argue some things in certain specific circumstances, but there's not sort of a a set of legal attributes that go to a founder that doesn't go to somebody else with that title. So, you know, we've seen people come in later be called founders and, you know, those folks may get a substantial portion of the company. Uh, one thing that is super critical and we didn't touch about today and touch on today, but it's super critical is just making sure that everybody's uh, interests vest <clears throat> usually over a four year period of time, usually with a one year cliff. Uh, that is, if they leave within the first year, they don't take anything with them, usually with double trigger acceleration, which means they'd have to be fired within a certain period of time of a change of control event, uh, as opposed to single trigger acceleration, which would just be them firing, being fired, or, or that change of control event. Um, and then the sort of, since I touched on that, the thing that I always want to follow up next, which is if you're vesting, you really need to think about making sure you filed your 83B election which is a little bit beyond the scope of today's discussion, but suffice it to say, it's a tax issue. It has to be done within 30 days of when, you know, when you're are entitled to your stock, not the stock certificate, but when you've gotten entitled to your stock, if that stock is vesting. Um, and I can touch about that if somebody wants to put, put a question at the end, happy to go into more depth, but, you know, so we will see anywhere from double digit percentage points down to just fractional percentage. The critical thing here when you're talking about equity to employees is um, vesting. There are four types of safe, valuation cap, no discount, discount, no valuation cap, valuation cap, discount, MFN, no valuation cap, no discount. Who makes the offer decision to use which one? Okay, so the one thing that I guess we didn't talk about is just an MFN, which is the most favored nation clause, which basically says, you know, if if somebody else cutting a substantially similar deal gets a better deal, whatever those better deal terms are, I get them. Now I've seen them come up in safes, I've seen them come up in convertible notes, I see them come up in other other financing documents, I see them come up in commercial documents. Um, that's what an MFN is, most favored nation clause. Uh, we don't, I, I can't say I see that used particularly often and I usually try and counsel against it because you, know, you should be cutting the deal. So here's, here's really the way the process should work. Get together with your counsel, you've run some pro formas, they're, they're set up, you haven't, you haven't goofed the formulas which are actually trickier than it sounds and certainly trickier than my example. And you put together your set of terms and then you go out in those set of terms are what the cap is, what the valuation, uh, excuse me, what the discount is going to be, may, maybe some other terms. <clears throat> and, uh, and you pick a closing date, you pick the amount that you want to raise, and you drive all those, you know, uh, all those cats, you heard all those cats, and you try and get them together at one time. Um, there are a few reasons to do that. They include, although it may be sort of a painful process, usually the, those clients end up with the best return because they kind of are able to generate some momentum uh, and, and get everything closed and at one point in time. So you don't have these issues of a continual rolling closing where you're out pitching constantly, burning time that you should be putting into developing your business, developing your technology, building your business. The other thing too is, um, you know, in the course of talking with these investors, 
intentionally or unintentionally, you're going to give them information and they may hang on to some information that is not current if you're doing these rolling closing, no longer current. And they may think, oh, well, the only reason why I put in my money was because he said he was going to raise $2 million. And if you show up short of that, you know, they've got, they've got the potential to come back later and say, well, look, they only raised one and a half. I should get my money back because the only reason why I put my money in was I was supposed to get 2 million. So who makes the offer and decision? What you're ideally going to do is put together the sort of that set of terms, go out, see if you can reach consensus and then close them all in the same term, or at least set that up so that you can do an initial close and then maybe one other close, basically again, sort of all on the same set of terms. It's a negotiation. So hopefully maybe you'll get a lead. You know, somebody will say, all right, if, you've, if you're raising a million and a half, I'll put in 750,000. So you can, you know, kind of take that information out with you in your raise and say, look, uh, I'm raising a million and a half, already got 750 circled. Um, here's what they're cut. You know, they're, they're the ones putting in the money, uh, we're putting in the bulk of the funds. So they've got the right, you, you don't have the right to deviate from what their terms are. You certainly can't cut a better term than that. I hope that answered your question. Um, you allude to things that you're talking about being in Silicon Valley. I'm in Boston. Does geography change things appreciably? If so, in what ways? So um, I think it's just the way that sort of business gets done. I have done some work in Boston. I've got Boston partners, so they do the bulk of that work. And, you know, we sync up and, you know, we just, we sort of have different mindsets. So in terms of, you know, uh, documentation sur surrounding the underlying documentation surrounding the investors, um, so, sort of what terms we would see, um, what, when someone would do a, a, a price round versus when someone would do a convertible note. Um, I think, I think um, there's not one way that's better, right? I mean, the reality of it is, is you know, it, well, in one sense, COVID has made the world even flatter than it otherwise would be. So we can reach out and talk to each other at any time. Um, in another sense, people still come to the table with the mindset of this is the way that I've done business in the past and it's worked for me. So I'm going to do business the same way. So I would just be mindful of the fact that if you're, if you're raising money from folks outside of your local geography, uh, the way they do business, the terms they're going to ask for in terms of what valuations are going to be. Okay. So sometimes there are differences in valuations. Silicon Valley is known for being <clears throat> heavy uh, on the valuation that is large valuations for, for companies ostensibly that's because it's probably more expensive here than anywhere else to build engineering teams. Um, so th I think that's probably one major term that you'll see. All right, we answered that question and then we gave some numbers for examples. Uh, I don't, we answered that question. Oh, Michael Liu. Um, how to avoid personal liability? Well, okay, so the reason why you have set up a corporation is to um, to have a personal liability shield in place as the corporation. So, so long as you uh, are not engaged in fraud and you don't, you know, give uh, and you don't personally guarantee anything, and you sort of adequately capitalize the corporation based on the way that you're starting it, you don't have to worry about personal liability in this sphere. So um, again, staying away from personal guarantees, um, making sure that you know, you're being honest and to the extent you're disclosing information to the uh, potential investors, you're disclosing all of the information, you're not omitting things that would sort of take something that um, would be untrue without having some additional information. You don't normally have to worry about that. So my email is at the beginning of the slideshow. It's jgordon at uh, pulsenla.com. There's some, some, I don't know, there's some conversation, I think, in the Q&A that I'm not following. Um, what does a relatively simple, safe cost to create in legal fees? Happy to answer all legal fee questions if you want to have a conversation with me. The reality of it is, is that by the time 
you've herded all the cats and taken care of any side letters, there can be a real range. So it's not something I feel comfortable sharing on this without understanding who the people are, what, who, who the potential investors are gonna be and um, whether or not we're talking about side letters or, or not. I mean, they can be pretty simple, just a few grand to in the six, you know, five, five figure range. Um, but you know, it depends on sort of what you're calling the safe financing. Um, can you talk about how to adjust a convertible note or pre-money safe so that there is a shared risk on dilution? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the reality the post money safe seems to push all the risk on the founder and gives away too much. So this is a great question. I think, yes, that's one reason why I said the pre money safe, I think is a little bit better. Um, a little more founder friendly, but at the end of the day, you build those models and either way you kind of live and die on those pro forma cap tables. So do, doing the hard work of doing the, the cap table calculations, I'm not the guy to do that, but I, um, I've got people in my network outside of my firm that do that. Um, that's going to be critical, you know, if you're trying to figure it out. So, you know, you can do pre-money safe, you can do post-money safe, just make sure you've done the math. That's, that's the real takeaway. How has COVID uh, affected raising seed money? Uh, so here's kind of what I've seen anecdotally and heard anecdotally in my conversations with my colleagues and folks outside the firm and investors. Uh, and also just following the sort of the industry, industry trade and journals. It seems like, you know, in the angel realm, uh, seed, seed, funding, seed fundings are going on. Um, is you kind of go to the bigger seed funding and where sometimes the micro VCs play and also, you know, the sort of series A fundings, it's really slowed things down a bit because it's harder for those, uh, for, for the companies to meet the capital and get vetted. So I, th I think it, now, um, I think it's it's a host of, of issues, um, which that's one of them. A another is if you are there are some companies that COVID has helped, right? Um, you know, if you were a company that it, like Zoom, for example, right? Um, that that's been a real boon to to those types of companies. But there are other companies that would have been, you know, uh, maybe travel based or something along those lines, and those are. Uh, at the very least uncertain these days. So money staying away from that is a little bit harder. Uh, pros and cons of converting a California S Corp to a Delaware corporation. Uh, I mean, the, the reality of it is, is that you're gonna need to have uh, a C Corp to get um, venture investment in. Now, whether or not that's a Delaware corporation is a different, um, sort of different but related question. Uh, and in terms of the pros and cons, uh, if you're super early and it's really just yourself, sometimes you know we can find that you can just you know start a new entity, start fresh. And then after that it becomes a lot more complicated fast. So you know and there's a question as to <clears throat> you know what's the, me the mechanism you know pr probably it's going to be a merger to flip it over. Um, so I'd love to take that question uh, in office hours. Happy to take that question in office hours. Again, all the answers that I'm giving today are um, general information off the cuff. Oh man, this is a great question. So what are the pros and cons to convert from an LLC to a B hyphen corp, a C corp co-timed with a round of funding, or maybe there are reasons that the investors may pass without notifying because of the LLC structure. Okay. Here's where it gets really confusing. So <clears throat> there are traditional corporations, there are LLCs, which are limited liability companies. There are public benefits corporations. There are benefits corporations out here in California, public benefits corporations in Delaware, same thing, or not, not the exact same thing, but analogous things. And then there are certified B Corps, which can be, um, which is basically a branding uh, and, and standard setting 
mechanism put out by B Labs, and you, you don't have to be a corporation to be a certified B Corp because it's a, a brand. It's a it's a surf, it's run by a, a third party. Now they've also um, sort of lobbied to have some model legislation put into place, but uh, that that's beyond the scope of today's discussion. In terms of timing <clears throat> with a round of funding, uh, it, that's always tricky and it's a one-off. So for example, sometimes we do it in connection with a round of funding uh, because that's what they're gonna insist on. Other times if it's early enough and there's only like maybe a founder or two, we'll flip it over way in advance of the funding. And that's, I'm working on one of those right now. And that's pretty simple to do that. That's the reason why you would do that. It gets to be more complicated because especially if you've created profits interests in your LLC to try and give folks equity incentive compensation, um, it becomes really kind of a tax nightmare. So, you know, my goal when I work with companies, or one vet, like, what is your path? Are you trying to be venture backed? If so, I think this is probably the way that's going to be the most efficient for you. That way you don't have to worry about converting later. You know, if not, that's fine. Like LLCs are perfectly fine business uh, entities for other purposes and operations. And if, if something walks in my door and it's an LLC, we take a look and we say, is now the right time to do it? Or are we just gonna be incurring legal fees where there's not really gonna be a, a real return at this point? If I get a million dollar contract with NIH and I drop in five patent applications, how does that affect stock option valuations for subsequent employees? So there are folks who do valuations. If you sign up and you use Carta, and this is not a plug for Carta, um, they will do your valuation. So here's the, here's the sort of high level overview of, of those issues. So the valuation is the value of the company at a point in time. If there's a material change in that company's, you know, either business gets better, business gets worse, it gets additional funding, that's a trigger to do another valuation. So I just don't know anything about your business to say whether or not a $1.5 million contract is that big a deal. I mean, if you're doing 500 million a year, might not, you know, that might not be material. If you don't do don't have any revenue, that's probably pretty substantial. So um, I think you should circle up with a valuation specialist for that. If I want to incorporate my business, should I just wait until January for tax reasons? Uh, so here's what the issue is here. Um, you get started in this year, you may need to, you'll probably need to pay full year's taxes, at least with, you know, Delaware and or California, um, as opposed to waiting. Now, the answer to that is, you know, the 800 or a thousand bucks, and, and sometimes actually there are, um, in California used to do this, I don't remember if it's currently in effect, but they'll waive your first year of taxes or whatever. Um, that's real money. But what's going on with your business, I think is the real question, right? If you've already got a couple of founders or other folks and you're taking it, you know, you're um, starting to generate prototype and you're generating real IP, I think um, the sort of money you'll save on incorporating um, is might not be worth it given that you would offset like a bunch of risk or you'd be able to potentially handle uh, and avoid, you know, some risk of a bunch of IP walking out the door. So I think that's not necessarily a particularly good, um, I think you just need to evaluate each of those situations to figure out what's the best. So I see right now that we're at 8.30. I'm gonna answer that question and just kind of see what's here. Right, okay, one person said if uh, you file on December 16th or later, they waive the 2020. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I know that there have been similar things like that in the past, so that wouldn't surprise me. Um, let me see if I can fly through these. Do we need to take business insurance? Uh, yeah, it's always good to talk to a, a, an insurance agent, find out if you need general commercial uh, insurance, especially if you've got um, folks on premises. Um, so I, I would talk to those folks, I'll defer to that. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to move quickly, see if I can do that. All right. Ooh. 
Uh, I know safes and convertible notes are, are intended for funding. I was curious to see if there's any advantage in using them for team members that might want to take a percentage ownership of a hotel or shopping center that we negotiate rather than putting them in the operating agreement, make it a win-win. Um, so safes and convertible notes. Okay, so operating agreements, usually the document that uh, uh, sets how an LLC is gonna run and how its members will interact. Safes and convertible notes are usually really intended for uh, C corporations, they can get um, modified to, to be used with LLCs. Uh, you better bring a tax person for that because it gets real complicated real fast, way above my pay grade to make sure that all that works out properly. But they're really designed as a mechanism to, um, to convert over in the future into equity based on financing. And so if that mechanism is not going to come into play here, it, it's, it's not really a the way that you typically would have um, you'd award equity. Additionally, you know, if folks are getting these notes, potentially they're going to have income tax <clears throat> on that if if they're basically getting them for services rendered, they'll have to pay. It, it's it's possible, and I've seen this before, where someone gets a convertible note, ten thousand dollar convertible note for services rendered, they it's as if they got $10,000 in cash. So they'll need to pay $3,000 in taxes, even though they don't have any cash to do that. Um, any advice for those inclined to think equity crowdfunding, particularly because of the latest regs increasing the crowdfunding limits? Okay, so great question. We're going into overtime. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how that played out because the, the limits have gone from 1 million to 5 million. And um, previously, we sort of found that the uh, cost to maintain the documentation, you know, between lawyers and accountants for raising crowdfunding just wasn't, um, it was too expensive compared to the money they raised, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. So I, I'm paying attention, but that's not really the, the space that I, typically play in it. I usually play in the reg D as, um, as opposed to reg CF. Okay. <laughs> Death by expense. I agree. I, I use my own money to develop um, a product and technology with a granted patent. Um, it's proved a game changer effective. My company's an LLC form. I want to raise money for market. Next round, should I get my company valued? Um, so when you're doing a valuation, and you know, I think we're going to uh, end this one on this on this on this question because we've run out of time. When you're doing evaluation, it's usually okay. So in the context of these types of companies, it's it's in connection with doing a 409 a evaluation so that you can issue options and you can have the right strike price for those options. The valuation that is done is not to sort of value the company so you know what to take it out to shop it with a VC. For. Again, the, the pre-money valuation you will get is a, with a BC is a negotiation as to really how much are they willing to pay for what percent of the company. Now, there are other contexts where if you, uh, you know, you move in IP back and forth between jurisdictions or there are other circumstances where you will want to get the company or the IP valued, but that's not what happens if you're just raising, uh, that, that's not the kind of valuation that you would have or do here. Um, so again, it's, it's usually an arm's length negotiation and that's what, and it's really just, especially an early stage company, how much is it that the VC thinks your company is gonna be worth in the future? How much are they willing to pay for some percentage of the company today? So with that in mind, um, I think we've used up all of our time and maybe gone a minute or two over. I wanna thank everybody for attending. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to follow up a little bit later uh, in the week with the recording and the slides. If you've got questions you want to reach out to me, my email is jgordon at pulsenla.com. Again, I um, have office hours Friday between 2 and 3 uh, Pacific time. And if that time doesn't work for you, let me know. I would be happy to see if we can find something that works if you're outside of my time zone. And then finally, I want to thank uh, idea to ipo for hosting today. It's been a pleasure to be here as always, and um, great questions, fantastic uh, conversation, and uh, thank you very much.
Have a great night and happy Thanksgiving.